Hi, everybody. Well, welcome back to show two of our new year. And thanks for coming back. Um, the first show, we were uh, catching up on the plants. We started with Calmagrasis and ended with Lobelia. And we've got this show now coming coming to know some, some plants. And I thought I'd share with you, I, I'm not really good at sharing things, uh, just like tapping myself on the back or something, but I, I wanted to, if you weren't aware that I, I, I wrote a book, okay? And it was totally by accident. I didn't really intend to ever write a book in my whole life, and my mom still doesn't believe I wrote a book, so I dedicated it to her. And, and I have to say, unfortunately, my mom reached 90 this year, and she, she unfortunately passed away from, from COVID. She caught it in December. And, and anybody you miss, you miss your mom. You know, you miss anyone who passes away who's cared and loved you your whole life. Dad, mom, ever, anybody. So I, I just wanted to show you this. Um, and sh she was appreciative that I actually dedicated this to her. She never quite understood what I did. She never quite knew how I'd ever make a living. My dad knew for sure I'd never make a living selling plants. He said, where's your benefits? Where's your retirement fund going to come from? So anyway, that's old news. But uh, I just wanted to share with you the, the book I wrote. It's, and I put together, there's 74 plants in here that you'd have to get up and make the effort to kill, at least in our region. That doesn't mean where you live, you can't kill them easily. But I think it stretches through the Midwest pretty good. And then I, I added some uh, grids. So that way it's like a, a simple recipe book where you can put the grids together. They're about 100 square feet. And I just laid out the plan. So basically to give people a good beginning. I think if you get a good beginning in a garden and a good start, and you care for that and nurture that consistently with whatever you are with your abilities, because your abilities will continue to grow as the plants and you familiarize yourself with each other. So I just thought I'd share the book and, uh, and also share um, about, you know, about my mom. I, again, she reached 90. She had a beautiful life. She had a one, and she freely admitted it. Um, but it's just, it's just what happens in life. And, and I, I just uh, thought I, you know, want to have that to say. Um, so off we go to our next uh, grouping. And I start again with my two questions to share with you and see how you feel about your answer to yourself. And one question is, what assumptions do you make about plants and how do they influence your nature of living with them? So what assumptions do you make? And I'll, I'll give you a story of an assumption I made. Back in 1979, I was at the Schulenburg Prairie and I was walking through the Schulenburg Prairie and I was walking along and I saw Saladego rigida this beautiful, look like a yarrow, beautiful flat flowers. It was probably about uh, 28, 30 inches tall, almost knee high. And I thought, God, this is a beautiful plant. And it was blooming in, in, the, in uh, August, September. Yarrow, Echelia, usually blooms in June. So I said, wow, this is a great plant. And I, you know, I, I just, I didn't know that much about plants in 79. I just started understanding that perennials live from year to year. <laughs> I was an outdoor ed teacher. So I grew it from seed. And I put it in the ground at Natural Garden. Everything was in the ground. We dug stuff and put it in a beer box for 50 cents. So I put Solid Eagle Ridge in the ground. I put about 25 in. You know, if we sold 10 or 15, that was pretty good for 50 cents a piece. You know, that's a, that's a good evening out at Dog and Suds, to be honest with you. So if you sell 20 plants, you've got a hell of a night at Dog and Suds. So the Solid Eagle Ridge, it grew in the ground. It got as big as me. So the assumption I made when I first saw it, that was 28 to 30 inches tall. How did solid go rigid to the same plant I saw that was 28 inches, how did it get to be four feet tall? And it was what I didn't know I didn't know. I didn't know that the solid go rigid at the Morton Arboretum was growing in rocks and gravel. The solid go rigid I planted at Natural Garden was growing in mushroom compost and highly organic uh, field soil. So it just grew like gangbusters. So when I dug one for somebody, I would put a root ball that big in one beer flat 
and you'd have a plant four feet tall that we would cut back so it would respond to transplanting. I only got 50 cents for giving away almost two and a half square feet of soil with that plant. But that, that again, that was that assumption I made about a plant. And then when I realized why and how a plant lives in different ways in different soils and the, and the importance of understanding the soils the plants live in, I began to know this system of planting better. And that was that assumption I made and how it affect, again, affected my nature of living. And I have to say, it's a surprise. I was supr so surprised that it wasn't 30 inches tall. So that was, that's an example of what I mean by what assumptions you make. The next question, are you comfortable with your understanding of the nature of plants living social lives? So how comfortable are you with the, with the awareness that plants are social beings? That they, they, they're just not, you know, like they're just not a system of things living in a pot appearing on a bench. That's not a social life for them. That's just someplace we put them to keep them content until we take them home. It's a, it's a mode of mobility. A plant in a pot is a way to get around. It's not a lifestyle. So again, are you comfortable with your understanding of the nature of plants living social lives? And I'm still not comfortable. I'm still learning that. I'm still trying to understand the social system of planting. And how do I, how do I learn more about it? It's by basically visiting remnant prairies or remnant woodland areas or remnant savannas, looking at systems still within a living system. And the more remnants I visit and the more remnants I spend time at, I start to understand how they live well together. And I, I pause and I walk. And that doesn't mean I know as much as I could know, but it's always a beginning to the next moment of understanding. So what I would pass on to you is find and visit remnant native populations of plants and be so joyful somebody took the time to find those and save them and point them out. The more we can understand the remnants of nature, the more we can enhance the beauty of open spaces. Not that we'll ever duplicate what's there, but that doesn't mean as humans, we can't keep creating something healthier, healthier, and healthier. And we just keep moving forward in that direction. Well, the next plant I left off with Lobelia syphilitica. I'm going to start with Millennia cereulia. And this first Millennia I liked a lot. And it, it does very well in southeast Wisconsin and northeast Illinois. It's Millennia Paul Peterson. It's a, a nice thing about the foliage is very lax but doesn't fall over and it gets around 30 36 inches tall and you can see it in this first image I have it interplanted with allium flavum and that's an allium that blooms in midsummer with fireworks of yellow so Millennia Paul Peterson is easy to grow loves average to moist soil and it grows sun to shade so you can you can have your planting in full sun and you can transition the patterns into shade and, and uh, again, it, to me, it's an easy plant to grow. Sometimes in August, September, the foliage will, will turn a little brown, during, especially during dry periods. And I've used it in St. Louis, and it's a, not a plant that responds well to very hot summer temperatures. So that would be one thing uh, to be aware of if you, the hot summer temperatures, the consistent ones in, in areas like St. Louis. The next millennia I really enjoy is transparent. Simply, it's a much taller plant. It's a millennia uh, arundinacea. The foliage gets around, oh, two and a half feet, very dense clustered foliage. But the flowers are arching and, and slightly upright and slightly arching. But you can see through it so beautifully. And you can see in this image, this is uh, in October. And you can see how you can find your way, your vision can find its way through the flowering stems. So that just opens up how many diverse, different ways this plant can be interplanted. And, and that gets to back to one thing I've talked about before. You know, what are these, I, I call them the magic ingredients of garden design and gardening. And I, I've, I've come to know three I call magic ingredients. And I've mentioned this before, but I, again, I like to go over this again, my five times uh, with people. Collaboration. Collaboration, 
That's where we, we all group together with our, with our special knowledge. We create teams, we create a team effort. And, and basically that's an action you take. When you collaborate with people, you're taking an action to call, interview, and share what you'd like to do with others. The other is partnership. Partnership is just the way you are. You know, it's just the way we are. We, we have friends that we can call and ask questions of, and ask questions to, and share with people. Those are the greatest partnerships you create. Who can you call to ask something of? If you have a question about a certain plan or a question about anything, you wanna buy a car and you have a question about a car, you create all these partnerships in life. And, and the key one is workability. When you do a design or you create a planting, is it, does, it, does it have the condition and performance it's of your actions? Can it be cared for? Are you putting something in that people can care for in a, in a joyful way, in a healthy way, and you can keep the planting moving forward in a good direction? And again, it's the condition and performance of our actions, of your action. What can happen when you take an action, create a design, what's the outcome? And sometimes I see outcomes that are, are modestly, or they're, they're just not, there's no future. I can see plantings and right away I can look at a planting and I can see the position of the plants and I, I don't see a future for them. And I see gardeners struggle. They have such good abilities, but they were put in a position to fail simply because the designs weren't well thought out. And then I have uh, this next image you see is plant, create plant communities. You see, I have them in little, in little boxes and this is what I apply to a plan. And each, each box has a certain percentage of plants combined with them. And then on the overall design, there's the hash marks and grid systems, and you just coordinate the percentage of plants in that box to that particular hash mark or grid. And that way it allows uh, people to lay out the planting material without the possibility of me being there. And when you have a budgeted construction, you only have so much to spend, we have to come up with ways that people can follow a more defined style of intermingled planting and create systems for them to be able to lay it out without the possibility of us being there to do it. So I think this image represents that well. And again, it's, it's creating the patterns and putting the patterns into play in larger scale. So I hope this helps you see uh, some of the ways that I put uh, thoughts into, into action on uh, plans and paper. So let's get back to plants. This is Monarda Bradburyana. I have to say, I never saw this plant in my life till I went to uh, Germany and met Cassie and Schmidt. And I saw it in full bloom and it was beautiful. It was short. It was only about knee high, maybe 24 inches tall. And I asked Cassie, I go, Cassie, where'd you find that Monarda? He goes, he looked at me, geez, Roy, it's native to Missouri in the Ozarks. I never, I never heard of it. I never saw it in the trade. I never saw it in a catalog. <laughs> And look at the beautiful coppery foliage it has when it emerges out of the ground. This is a cool plant. And it's a durable plant. Um, the next image, you can see it in bloom. This is at uh, Lurie Garden. Pete used it in, uh, right outside the Salvia River. And it's interplanted uh, with uh, Ampsonia. And it's, a, it's just a beautiful plant, easy to grow does not get powdery mildew that easily. In fact, the gardens I, I have it in, I, I have not seen powdery mildew be an issue in any of the plantings. And here I've got it mingled with uh, Carex brevior, Sparablus heterolepis, and Allium flavum. It blooms in June, it has the copper foliage, but the beautiful part that sometimes people don't see are the seed heads. The seed heads are coppery green, fading to brown. They're beautiful round, coppery green seed heads. Sometimes they're more attractive than the flower. So it's a wonderful plant and it, it, it has a, a way of being entertaining through the year. Limited powdery mill, it's just a nice plant to incorporate and it mingles well with so many diverse, uh, has so many ways of being diverse combinations. And this is uh, the next picture we move into is Allium Summer Beauty which we talked about earlier, with Nepeta early bird. I saw Nepeta early bird uh, for the first time at Pete Outoff's garden back in 2007. And I, I, uh, I have a few plants. I had a few plants that I got home with me. 
and I started doing cuttings of it. And now I think it's in the trade. It's pretty easy to find. But what I like about an epidural early bird, boy, it just blooms the first week in May. This is about May 10th. Continues to bloom all the way into early July. And you don't have to prune it. So I, I don't prune it. And it keeps putting out moments of color all through the summer. And it's, it gets around, uh, oh, maybe 12 inches tall, 10 to 12 inches tall. But it does get wide quickly. It'll get big as a manhole cover, about 20, 24 inches wide the second or third year. So when you mingle it in combinations, you have to be aware of the width of that plant and how fast it, how fast it gets that wide. So that's that coming to know growth habit and growth rate. But it's a wonderful plant, again, blooms early, and it's very easy to use, and at minimal seeding. It doesn't seed near as much as the Nepeta racemosa that you can start from seed, so you don't have large numbers of, of seedlings to deal with. This is another Nepeta, the next picture we move into. And I really like this plant, Nepeta subsessilis. It gets around three feet tall, has beautiful, there's pink flowers, these are soft blue, and it's, it's good in average to moist soil. And it keeps its upright habit for quite a while. It doesn't, it doesn't lean or fall over, so it keeps a nice architectural look. And in this photo, it's, it's fronted with Stakey's officinalis humulo. So I just wanted to share this one with you because I don't see it used that much. But I think it's another plant that, when you come to know it, will help you uh, oh, broaden your plant combinations. And it does seed, but it doesn't seed that readily. So you will have some seedlings come up. And again, the dynamics of it, it might seed in the right place to make something even more, more enjoyable. So I, I would... Give Nepeta subsessilis a try and see, again, see how many different combinations you can write down when you understand the growth rate and growth habit of this plant. Our next image is a plant I don't think anybody has grown. I just started growing it four or five years ago. It's Orbixillium pedunculatum. Now that's a mouthful. And it took me probably six months to learn how to say it properly. And I don't even know if I said it properly just now. Orbixillium pedunculatum. It's a native legume. It's called Samson root. It grows on wooden edges in dry prairie. So I tried it and I've planted it now in many of the gardens at Northwind. I'm trying to sample it and see where, I want to see its forgiving nature. Can I put it, what, how much moisture will it take? How much uh, dry, drought will it take in clay soil compared to well-drained gravelly soil? So I've got it in four or five different gardens and it's doing very well. It has a candelabra of short, light lavender flowers, a native legume. And interesting too, I haven't, it hasn't been bothered by rabbits yet at, at Northwood. So now this year, my goal is to take it off the property. I've, I've used that one job I did last year. So I'm gonna, again, take it off the property, try it in some different planting additions on different sites. But I just wanted to share this with you, Orbixillium, Orbixillium pedunculatum. Good native legume, easy to grow, and I think it has some good characteristics for our soil adaptability. Next image is wild quinine, Parthenium integrifolium. It's like, wow, if you're not using this plant, buckle up. When you put this plant in, it has beautiful white flowers, blooms early to mid-June, continues a strong blooming performance into mid-August, September. Earlier on the last uh, episode I showed it with Echinacea purpurea. The Echinacea purpurea was done flowering. Um, this next image you see it with uh, Panicum rostral bush. You can see it against the red foliage. It has a nice upright habit, slightly arching, beautiful white flowers, and, and a great coarse textured foliage. Heavy green to coarse textured foliage. And here it is with the Echinacea purpurea, which I mentioned from the other show we saw. But the Echinacea purpurea is now uh, going into, into the seed heads, seed production. And look at the Parthenium, still beautiful white flowers. And at this time now, the Sprabulus heterolepis is blooming in this picture. So it's a, a, a good plant to combine with you know, just a lot of plants. Vertical habits, slightly arching. And here with the Echinacea and the Sprabulus is creates a nice pattern. Uh, the next, these two plants, I, I call them edging plants. And a good friend of mine, uh, who you should 
get on your YouTube channel. His name is Ken Williams. He's got a beautiful YouTube channel that talks about garden care. He's an, he's an excellent gardener and he's completely absorbed with caring for plants and, and, and hoeing using the Dutch push pole hoe. And he's very informative. And his, his thought is trying to find plants like the ones I'm showing you here. This is Senecio aboveda or Pacara aboveda and Geum triflorum, prairie smoke. And I know Ken loves prairie smoke. He incorporates them in all the little gaps and holes in the garden. And the prairie smoke runs and hits, runs and hits, runs and hits. The prairie smoke, or what I mean runs and hits, it hits the crown of other plants and stops. But what it does, it takes up space where weeds would grow, fills that space up, cutting down the sunlight from hitting soil, so you minimize your weed population by quite a bit. The quicker you keep the sun from hitting the soil, the less weed seed germination you'll have. So it's how fast can you tighten your garden up in a healthy way so each plant is benefiting the other. And Ken has been very effective using prairie smoke, the GM triflorum. And, and it blooms in, in its natural habitat. It blooms in late May, mid-May. And, and the native, the prairie grows up around it, so the prairie actually shades it out so it can, it can live a healthy life on limited sunlight because that's what it's done its whole life. So it's a great, again, a good plant to fill in between voids on an edge or within, within a garden where modest amounts of light can still get through. And the other one, the Pacara, is the same way. I use Pacara oveda on woodland plantings and it keeps running till it hits something. And in one planting I have on the lake, it runs right up into the crown of a tree and then it wraps itself around the crown and the roots of the tree because it loves dry soil. So it sends these little runners out. And I, I don't, again, I put this in the second year in between the sedge matrix and I let it find its way through, a, through the planting. And it's very exciting to watch where it's going to go. So that's Pacra oveda and Geum triflorum. And these are two plants I think will show you an opportunity of how to fill edges and voids within certain styles of planting. So I mentioned in the other show, and I'm highlighting on this image, using old plants in new ways. It's an un unbelievably rich pursuit of something to think, I know this plant, well, what else can I do with it? I've done this before, I've done this before, I put this group in, I've done that group. And that doesn't mean you're done. It's like, well, I've used the letter A almost a million times in my life. I don't know what else to do with the letter A, that's stupid. You can keep using and discovering words and vocabulary. You can keep, it's just how, how richly do you want to pursue that? And that's the same with plants. When you take an old plant you think you've used enough, no, you haven't. There's more and more combinations out there you can keep trying and finding and putting plant systems together. So here, here is uh, Provskia. Now you're all used Provskia triplicifolia and also Provskia little spire is in this group of photos. But this is Provskia triplicifolia interplanted with Echinacea virgin. Virgin has the flower petals that go straight out. And it's just simply woven in between the Provskia. Again, it's 70% Echinacea, 30% Provskia triplicifolia because the Provskia just takes up more space. So I use a higher percentage of vertical Echinacea with a lower percentage of the mounding Provskia triplicifolia. And here's Provskia with Lobelia syphilitica, which I showed in the earlier show. This is back at the Art Institute. And the Lobelia does a beautiful job of blue shading to green. The blue, when the blue flowers, the petals fall off, the seed heads are green. So you have these beautiful spikes of green going to brown into October as the seeds mature. In between the ghost gray of Perovskia, as that plant goes from soft yellow, the soft yellow calyx after the petals drop off, to a beautiful ghost gray in October. And here's the ghost gray of Perovskia, you can see it in the next image, with uh, Baptisia australis minor and Schizacrium scoparium little blue stem. This would be in, this is probably in early October to mid-October. So really it's all about composition. On this next image, I, I discuss that again and share that. It's, it's about plants and knowledge of plants, but it's the way we put the plants together. It's the musical part, the musical component, putting the notes together to create the harmony and the sound 
that we can tap our feet to. So again, I just want to remind us, remind all of you, it's about how you place the plants together. It's all about the composition. Next plant is Rebecca speciosa. Um, there's a number of ways this plant is known. It's Rebecca, Rebecca sullivanti speciosa, Rebecca fulgita speciosa. Um, so I've learned it as Rebecca speciosa. And I grow the species simply because I like the way it goes vertical and slightly arching, because I love the way it can lean into things. And it's, and it's, it's more forgiving to drier soils, I found, than Rebecca fulgita fulgita or a Rebecca fulgita goldsturm, which I, I don't really use anymore because of the leaf spot. But Rebecca speciosa, you can see in these two images how it kind of leans gently into things, but yet maintains somewhat of an upright habit. In the next image, I have it planted with, with uh, a silby purpurkers. And you can see it gently, again, leaning, but yet maintaining an upright growth habit. The next picture I got to is, uh, again, back to Brent Hovarth. He came up with this beautiful Rebecca called American Gold Rush. Now you can see the mounding habit of it. So unlike Speciosa, which has an upright and lax habit, Rebecca American Gold Rush has a beautiful mounding habit. But the cool thing about the parentage of this plant that Brent used, he used Rebe Rebeccaia missouriensis, which tolerates very dry soil. So American Gold Rush goes very nicely into drier soil conditions without wilting or declining. So I really like American Gold Rush. And the cool thing is if you put it in more shade, you can see how tightly it grows together in the sun. In more shade, it gets slightly looser. So it's it opens up a little bit more, which is a very nice component in the shade, especially when you have it mixed in a shade sedge meadow. And this is uh, Rebecca Viet's Little Susie, which I used at the Art Institute. Viet's Little Susie is nice. It can't take as much drought as American Gold Rush, but again, it has a little more open growth habit than American Gold Rush. So again, you can mingle the two together Instead of having one monoculture of one or the other, try putting a certain percentage of each one together. It's like have some fun. The next plant uh, we will be looking talking about, I really like Salvia Wisui. I started uh, back in the 80s. I had Salvia East Friesland I was growing at the Natural Garden, and I did a lot of salvias from seed. But most of the salvias I did from seed uh, could, could handle water conditions. They, they rotted out. So I, I just stopped using and stuck with Salvia East Friesland. Then I discovered Salvia Wisui. I think, I'm not sure how I got it in the mid 90s. I, if I got it from Brent or if I, I'm not sure. But what I liked about Salvia Wisui, boy, the thing was blooming in mid-May and it was standing so upright. Unlike Salvia East Friesland and Salvia May Night, I gave up with as soon as I tried it because Salvia May Night was the first plant to fall over on me. It would bloom, fall over. Salvia Wisui stood upright, bloomed all the way into July. And you can see how it reblooms to its old, on this next image, how it reblooms to its old flowers. So I have, you have the new flowers coming up through the old ones, and that meant I didn't have to prune anything. You could prune it if you want, but you don't have to prune it if you don't want to. And it was so beautiful going in with the new flowers coming up through the, the calyx of the old flowers going from purple to brown. It's a very attractive, almost impressionistic look. And here it is mingled with Salvia Snow Hill. And uh, so there's no, again, there's no limit to the combinations you can do or the mixture of salvias. There's another one uh, out now called Crystal Blue. I was introduced to that by Pete Outoff at a project we did this year. And I like Crystal Blue because it's a soft blue that stays upright. And I mingled that now with Snow Hill or I mingle it with Salvia Wisui and East Friesland because I get different bloom periods. The, as the Wisui is starting to slowly stop blooming, but yet new flowers are coming up, East Friesland takes over the, the heavy flowering component along with Salvia Crystal Blue. So again, it's, it's really scary how many different things you can come up with and exciting. So here's Salvia East Friesland in this next image with Allium atropurpureum. This is cool. I'm pointing at my surface, but that's not cool. It's the image you're seeing that's cool. Those flat, beautiful flowers 
of allium natural purpurium with the spikes of salvia it's, it's just It's just a darn nice look and really attracts people's attention. This is a planting I did at the Art Institute. This is Salvia caradana with the darker stems. I like the darker stems because they contrasted, as you can see, the geranium sanguineum album. But the important part about this picture, it's the first week in June, it's about June 8th, you don't see bare soil. So when you can remove sunlight from hitting soil, as I mentioned earlier, there's minimal weeding to do here. This is more a suppression garden. We've cut light off from hitting soil, so the Wheat competition is very minimal from mid-June on, simply because there's no opportunity for light energy to hit the soil to promote the germination of weed seeds. And here's a salvia wisui with geranium orion. You see the way geranium orion leans into and spreads into the spikes of the salvia? Geranium orion is a very durable geranium, and what I like about it, it doesn't split open. Like Drain Johnson's blue, it'll flower and it falls over and you have to prune it back. Drain Orion, as it's flowering, it fills its center with new growth. So it doesn't, it doesn't have that moment of, of opening up in the center. So I was mentioning the salvia mixed with Geranium Orion. It's really a good combination. And the characteristics of Geranium Orion are garden friendly, I have to say, without it falling over. So anyway, we'll finish with uh, Salvia Wisui and the good old Geranium Orion. And thanks again for, for being here and thanks again for having me share some time with you talking about gardening. I really appreciate it. And I'll talk to you soon with our last episode and coming to know some plants. Bye everybody, thank you.